By the year 2009, there were a number of studies that had been published and uh, the evidence for the prevention of perioperative hyperthermia was mounting. And this paper, uh, originating from the University of Toronto and published in the Journal of the American College of Surgeons, is uh, um, my um, support for uh, the uh, measurement of temperature in uh, standard locations that we are familiar with, like the the uh, esophagus, uh, um, the oral pharynx, um, the nasal pharynx is uh, uh, a uh, very accurate location if the uh, temperature probe is um, uh, placed correctly. Uh, these these uh, guidelines uh, place uh, infrared tympanic membrane uh, or auditory canal uh, thermometry in a, at a very low uh, grade of uh, recommendation. Uh, in this um, uh, study uh, or review, they bring up the uh, potential of uh, risk of infection. Uh, associated with forced air devices, and uh, this has been reviewed recently in the uh, Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. Um, the authors uh, express the uh, concern that uh, forced air warming could disrupt the laminar airflow, which is uh, uh, used in some orthopedic operating rooms, and. Uh, inoculate the the uh, surgical wound with uh, bacteria uh, of some uh, from the floor, for example. The uh, authors, in their recommendations in this review, uh, concentrate on the proper um, maintenance and use of uh, the equipment. Um, they uh, make the statement that. Uh, um, treatment of hypothermia with uh, uh, prevention of hypothermia using forced air warming devices is uh, cheaper than uh, designing uh, laminar airflow operating rooms. Overall, the uh, proof of forced air warming devices as a cause of uh, infections has felt to be not proven. Um, there is a recommendation in the literature by these authors, Leg and Hamer, who recommend that the vertical drape be put up before the bear hugger is turned on. <coughs> in conclusion, in this review, uh, it is felt that further study is warranted to prove or disprove a causal relationship between the use of forced air warming and periprosthetic joint infections. There are um, guidelines in other countries and in the United Kingdom this uh, handout from 2008 is uh, available online and um, it's good. It's worthwhile reading, I believe. Um, they uh, make the pitch that uh, that forced air warming is is uh, cost effective compared to usual care, and that uh, special care should be taken to keep patients comfortably warm after they've been given pre medication. They uh, Propose that the ambient temperature in the operating room be at least 21 degrees C when the patient's exposed, and that is equivalent to about 69.8 or 70 degrees Fahrenheit, so somewhat warmer than many of our operating rooms. Uh, they also propose that induction of anesthesia should not begin unless the patient's temperature is 36 degrees or above. Um, the uh, effects of pre-induction warming have been studied as far back as 1993 and uh, Dr. Sessler and colleagues uh, used uh, pre-induction warming and studied the temperature drop 
during surgery and showed that uh, uh, that there is less uh, temp temperature drop um, in preborn patients, and also that there is less evidence of vasoconstriction on arterial line um, traces. Uh, with respect to other medications, uh, ketamine can be used for induction of anesthesia, and the uh, effect of ketamine on redistribution hypothermia is less compared to um, volatile agents. Um, the effect of medications on sweating uh, through interference with thermoregulation uh, is such that uh, Propofol, alfentanil, and dexmedetomidine all increase the sweating threshold, uh, but the gain in maximum intensity of sweating remain normal during isoflurane anesthesia. Vasoconstriction occurs before shivering. All volatile agents decrease the vasoconstriction threshold. Shivering is the last mode of thermoregulatory defense, and nitrous oxide decreases vasoconstriction and shivering thresholds less than the equipotent dose of volatile agents. Non-shivering thermogenesis does not occur in adults. Um, midazolam is such a common premedicant that uh, Dr. Sessler and colleagues uh, decided to study uh, its effect on thermoregulation in female volunteers. And as you can see, they received significant, significant amounts of midazolam and, uh, over, over a period of time. And were warmed or cooled uh, either uh, uh, and the, um, the effect on sweating and vasoconstrictive thresholds were um, determined. The study is quite elegant and used temperature, skin surface temperature from at least 15 sites and shivering was measured by EMG. The, con the findings were such, were the midazolam slightly decreases thre sweating threshold, but reduced the vasoconstrictive threshold more, leading to tripling of the interthreshold range, but not interfering with uh, the interthreshold range as much as seen with enflurane, isoflurane, or propofol. This is a study from Japan where um, Intramuscular midazolam was used, and it's although not a common mode of uh, administration of midazolam, uh, it is interesting that uh, the premedication in these patients had uh, uh, was associated with less uh, hypothermia. However, patients who were um, less sedated had a, a, a greater temperature drop than those that were. Um, more heavily sedated, the uh, hypothermia was also uh, seen. Um, we uh, consider shivering to be uh, undesirable, and of course you've probably um, heard or have quoted the uh, increase in, in um, oxygen consumption with shivering in the post anesthesia care unit to be 400 percent and uh, for patient comfort and for uh, uh, prevention of, of, uh, of uh, myocardial ischemia, treatment of shivering is indicated and meperidine is probably the most commonly used one and may operate through non-mu opioid receptors. Other uh, agents have been uh, studied and a Cochrane review um, on the use of alpha-2 adrenergic agents for the prevention of shivering has been published in, uh, in, the, fair, in the last year. Uh, overall, however, uh, while dexmetadomidine and clonidine may reduce postoperative shivering, uh, the quality of the evidence is considered to be somewhat low. Let's move on to the next wave in patient warming. Uh, when uh, the inventor of the bear hugger, Dr. Augustine, sold his interest. He invented a new patient warmer and called it the hot dog. The hot dog website uh, provides information regarding the bear hugger, his previous invention, and purports that it is uh, uh, 
a sp sp spreader of uh, MRSA. So uh, uh, you're getting a f bit of a flavor for the uh, the uh, effect, uh, uh, the views uh, of co competition. While the bear hugger is uh, is probably the most prevalent uh, um, device uh, in order to uh, re replace it with uh, a new invention such as a hot dog, one would have to show that the uh, the old device was uh, deleterious, and there are uh, there are uh, lawsuits uh, in the uh, in the courts at this point in time alleging that uh, infections have been caused by bear huggers. For what it's worth, however, the hot dog is um, uh, on the market and uh, according to the website it's very cost effective and it consists of c controller and warming blankets and of uh, various descriptions. Um, I pr present to you here a uh, an extract from a law firm w which uh, offers free consultation if you uh, think that you may have uh, been uh, injured by a, a 3M bear hugger. So far I've not been able to find the outcome of the 2013 case brought by Tommy Watson against 3M. Other complications of uh, temperature uh, management include the nodding of a nasal temperature probe, Now, in this um, retrospective study, which used infrared thermometry, and uh, there was the somewhat uh, uh, unexpected um, conclusion that hypothermia was not associated with adverse outcomes. So uh, I would say that uh, that the uh, this study is. Uh, Although it's it's from 2013, it has enough limitations that uh, it can't be used uh, as evidence to uh, um, uh, ignore hypothermia. The um, unplanned perioperative hypothermia in 2012 was uh, examined in this study and uh, I, I this pu publication reminded me that the other day anecdotally I asked if the bear hugger was on and, and the response from the OR nurse was that it was on unfortunately uh, after the development of uh, hypothermia um, I examined the uh, uh, setting on the bear hugger, and while it was on, it was uh, the heat was not on. So, uh, ca caveat emptor. Um, in this slide. Uh, I, which was published in anesthesiology just uh, in July, uh, you know this this study concludes that compliance with with the SKIP project for body temperature management is associated with improved clinical outcomes. Interestingly enough, uh, the SKIP. Uh, uh, measure for temperature has been retired uh, and is not uh, being used anymore. The authors include Dr. Uh, Frank, who is one of the original uh, investigators of uh, hypothermia in the 1990s. And uh, the uh, 
authors of this study do mention the limitations of their study, that it was a retrospective study, it used hand-entered data, there was missing data, and they also acknowledge that the body temperature impact you may or may not be true temperature. So, in conclusion, uh, this part of uh, the second part and coming to the end of the uh, the uh, podcasts, um, I will reiterate and bring to your attention the key points and the key points of of uh, temperature management and hypothermia and therm uh, thermal regulation. Uh, I think are best summarized in the uh, in chapter 48, and I'm putting it up on this screen here for you to uh, to read and consider and and study, so that uh, you'll be prepared to uh, uh, field any questions that might come up with respect to this topic in um, your. Uh, clinical practice and maybe uh, just as importantly uh, during any oral examinations that you uh, uh, are subject to. So uh, thanks for your attention and best of luck. Um, this concludes uh, the second of two parts of this September 1, 2015 podcast.